The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening and welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. The Convention Center Authority has been in the midst of a controversy between the Speaker of the House and the Republican Party now for quite some time. And also, too, may be the subject of conversation in a grand jury. You never know, because although there have been plenty of substantiated uh, facts that lead you to believe that the state grand jury is investigating the story we're about to talk about, where that happened, where that, where that, where that's going, and, and what the current status is always secret, um, and you may never know un, until you do know. It's just the way the system works. But there's been a flap going on here between the Speaker of the House and the Republican Minority Leader Blake Filippi, who will be my guest this evening. The Speaker made some assertions on a televised debate with his district opponent for his seat, uh, Barbara Ann. Fenton Fung, and he had a debate, and he made some assertions regarding this Convention Center Authority controversy and whether or not there ought to be an audit there. Confusing, yes, but something you should learn about, absolutely. Let's, uh, let's get into it. And so, Blake Filippi, the state minority leader, joins us. This, this confusion over the Convention Center Authority, uh, I think, is probably at a level representative where very few people understand the details of this. Do you agree? Sure. Sure. I think, yeah. I think it is a kind of a wicked web. Yeah. So by the way, welcome. It's great to, great to have you on the broadcast. The, the, uh, so we should just go ahead and reset the entire, the entire tangled web here. This conversation is about your letter to the Speaker of the House based on a, a broadcast uh, debate between he and his opponent for the mayoralty, uh, Barbara Ann Fenton Fung, and he had a dialogue about the Convention Center Authority because he uh, has been investigated clearly on the Convention Center Authority, and although the grand jury did not come back with any kind of charge, there's still this lingering scent that he tried to pull a fast one. So let, let's let's go backwards first on the convention center story, and uh, rather than having me explain it, uh, you give your version and I'll fill in some holes there. <laughs> okay. So uh, the, there's this thing called the Auditor General. The Auditor General audits department and state departments and state government. In order to uh, audit a corporation that was created by law, like the Convention Center Authority. The Auditor General needs to be directed by a majority of the Joint Committee on Legislative Services. The Joint Committee on Legislative Services is House and Senate leadership, uh, three House members, two senators, two Democrats, uh, two, two Democrats, three Republicans. I'm one of the Republicans on the JCLS. Uh, without a vote of the committee, without a majority of the committee as required by law, the, um, to me, the Speaker ordered the Auditor General to conduct an audit of the Convention Center. Uh, in December of 2019. In January of 2020, I approached the speaker and said, listen, it's, it's not lawfully proceeding. Uh, you need to have this audit be blessed by a majority of the Joint Committee on Legislative Services. Uh, as an aside, the Joint Committee on Legislative Services is a phantom committee. Uh, it hasn't met in over 10 years, uh, but it manages to spend $46 million a year. Uh, essentially, it's controlled by the speaker, without any participation of the other members, this bipartisan group, and it's our contention that it's controlled unlawfully by the speaker. What was interesting about this is that he ordered, he, he ordered the, the, the convention center audit because of a political thing, um, because of a personal political thing. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. You've written a letter to him based on some things that he said over the course of this debate. And we're going to get to that in a moment. But as we go back to the story, the story is, is that the convention center had a personnel challenge, a, a, an ally and campaign worker for the speaker uh, reportedly got caught up in a personnel matter. And, um, the speaker, you know, sent the message that, you know, unless that personnel matter get fixed, he'd be audited. Now, he'll deny that, but there was enough substantial discussion from the Convention Center Authority and formal response by the Convention Center Authority to the speaker 
um, and to authority about wanting to have this investigated that it's pretty well understood that he was using and flexing his speaker muscle uh, in order to accomplish a task that had really nothing to do with the people's business. Do you agree? I mean, if, if the allegation, I mean, so the speaker said secret information has gotten to him, which made him feel compelled to order the audit. Frankly, an audit Republicans have been asking for for a long time. I don't know what was in his head at the moment. Is, 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 there, is it reasonable to conclude it was solely a personnel issue? Certainly. The speaker has said he has secret information that Mr. Demers, the gentleman who had the personnel issue with the convention center, uh, that he, Mr. Demers gave the speaker secret information. Uh, I'd like to know what that secret information is. You know, maybe that secret information screams audit, screams audit, uh, but the speaker should not be withholding that secret information from the JCLS, who is the only body that can order a lawful audit of the convention center. Look, so we need to have a meeting where this is discussed. Yeah, well, so, you know, why, the, why this is important to the people? Well, look, the convention center authority gets $20 million a year uh, out of the state budget. Uh, I don't think anybody in their right mind should ever say that we don't want to see a very strict and specific oversight of the convention center authority. Uh, they do have a, a regularly scheduled audit, and then there are performance audits, and there's a difference between the two. Um, you, you guys are, are battling over a performance audit here that, that, needs, that needs to be accomplished. Um, and the convention center authority should welcome that. What the authority was saying is, look, we've just been threatened with a performance audit based on a personnel matter that the speaker has no right getting involved in, so um, we're crying foul. Now, the politics, internal and external, sometimes there are no heroes and there are no goats and there's a whole bunch of stuff in between and you know, all this kind of thing, right? What, what it was interesting is that you decided to, to take a, a legal action and you sued the speaker for his unilateral decision to, to employ this audit, which he then rescinded. Based Correct. on based on the public reaction and your litigation, uh, he then has and so that's kind of where it's been. As I recall, you have never said that there should not be an audit to the convention center authority. You just wanted to see the process done the right way because this JCLS has been acting uh, well. Has been has been as you say, I think accurately, phantom. And there are other things that you're also concerned about in terms of the JCLS and other operational stuff. And it's just, you know, you know, where the bodies are buried and where the money is, is, is spent and, and how the hires are made. And right. That's kind of, so it's all tied in, not just to the convention center authority, but an operating JCLS is part of your goal. Correct. Yeah. The, the convention center scandal was a straw that broke the camera uh, camel's back. Basically uh, it, it crossed a red line where we said, okay, we, we've got to fix JCLS. As much as we want an audit, and, and we'll get to the letter, because we still want one of the convention center, um, that's spending, that's about $20 million a year, taxpayer money going out the door. Uh, JCLS, there's $46 million per year of taxpayer money going out the door. And that's unilaterally controlled by the speaker. Um, he's taken the position in, lit in the litigation that he can do whatever he wants, um, all alone, without the consent of the members of JCLS. So that's we, just a huge problem. And we should make it clear. So, so the convention center is a line item in the budget at $20 million, as Blake says, going out the door. The JCLS, $46 million, is the actual operating expense of the General Assembly. Now, it, so it is a line item as well, but... It is the hub. It's it's the general management money of the General Assembly, and um, recent culture and tradition has that the speaker is just running the show the way he wants to, and the Constitution calls for a full body to be able to be making the decisions, not on the pencils and papers necessarily, but on you know on on the big picture stuff of that forty six million. Correct? Yeah. Who gets hired? what office space is allocated to reps. Um, it controls everything, everything in that building. And it needs to be controlled by a bicameral, bipartisan body because it can be abused. Right. And that's so, why JCLS was set up. 
So to, to, to sum on this story, you sent a letter to the speaker after he made his remarks on this, on this news conference and in, in, uh, on, on this, on this the, the debate on our, um, uh, over on Channel 10. You, you, you quote him as saying, every time we put $20 million of public money into the operation that's losing that amount of money, uh, it needs to be looked at, whether today, tomorrow, or some other time, the operation needs to be looked at. His opponent, Barbara Fenton Funk, said, then why did you pull the audit back when you got called out in the press? And he wrote, I want to go forward with the audit because Republican Minority Leader Blake Filippi would not vote with me, even though Republican Leader Morgan, your predecessor, was calling for that same audit for years. You write a letter and say, what is it? Well, so summarize what you're saying here. That it's, that's not true, is what you're saying. It's not true at all. It's not true at all. Since since everything went south at the end of January and we, we filed this lawsuit against the speaker, we've been saying, listen, look, this lawsuit has as many general components about how JCLS must operate, but it's indisputable that an audit can only go forward with a majority of JCLS. Indisputable. It's the reason he voted to pull back the audit. Uh, he pulled back the audit. It's the reason the Convention Center Authority voted to not comply with the audit because a majority of the JCLS did not vote for this audit. And I've been on record saying, let's have a meeting, let's have a vote, let's do this audit right, let's do it lawfully. We support an audit, we do not support an illegal audit. Got it. All right, when we come back, we'll, uh, we'll elaborate on, you know, where the General Assembly is, how it's operating, some of the ideas that the Republicans have had recently, and, you know, what the prospects are for this fall in terms of uh, running the show. We'll be right back with State Representative uh, on my state of mind. Stay with me. Back with State Representative Blake Filippi from Block Island, Charlestown, at all. The, 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 the politics of the audit aside, um, nothing can be functionally accomplished, it seems, right now until the General Assembly gets back into regular order. Uh, and we are still awaiting, you know, regular business. I mean, the, the, the governor's authority uh, under COVID has been extended. You know, we've already talked about this idea that you guys are going to get together for a couple of days after after the November election to, to try to put the P's and Q's in order and then to, to, to issue, you know, bond questions and have a special election for a bond question, which is a, like a bullet vote. I mean, people are clueless about bond questions. If you do a special election, they won't even show up. I mean, eight people will decide whether or not we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in bonds. Uh, any word on the ground at all about any kind of pressure to get back to some level of normalcy with the General Assembly? I mean, I hear it from the people. I mean, you said as we get back to regular order, I mean, I'd even take irregular order over what we have now, which is no order. Uh, we at best do perfunctory meetings of the Finance Committee to review ancillary budget items. We're not tackling the issues in front of us. Um, the General Assembly needs to be in session. We need to be dealing with the problems that people face in, with our budget, with oversight of the governor's actions. Um, nothing's been going on. And I don't know what the plan is, but I think it's cynical to put it off until after the November election. And I think that one of the reasons they're doing that is because there's a lot of promises that have been made that probably won't be able to be kept. A lot of hard decisions that are gonna have to be made and um, people don't wanna make that before elections. And I just think um, by delaying this, we're increasing the pain on the people of Rhode Island. And I just so wait, think so it's kind of cowardly. When you talk about promises kept and, and, and maybe not made, you, you're talking about you're, you're talking about what public hires. Um, the, the you know the payroll of the state is going to be severely impacted by by the economic trends and by COVID. And look, the governor has been holding back. Oh, let me not extend the question. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about everything from local aid, school aid, buddies and family members that have been hired in state government to the car tax. I mean, everything, if we have a billion dollar hole to close, kind of everything's on the table. And I just think that there's a lot of politicians that have built a house of cards over the years, built an unsustainable government that would not be able to handle a recession and a cyclical economy. Our Republicans have been predicting it. The chickens have come home to roost and they want to push off the pain until after the election to save their electoral skin. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, I, I wouldn't be so cynical about the decision to push off our budget debate and vote 
if the General Assembly had actually been doing its job over the past six months. We can't even get the General Assembly to come in there and conduct meaningful oversight of the governor's exercise of the legislative power during this crisis. We're not doing anything. We've walked away. So I, I look at this budget decision in the context of the del um, dereliction of duty over the past six months, and um, it's the same song and dance. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> the, the governor and the speaker and the Senate president, you know, send a message that they agree that they're going to wait until after November to get back into business, as if the general, as if the governor ever had a hand in the organizational role of, of the General Assembly. It, 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 it has become a perverted process uh, in, in the sense that everything that is normal and healthy about government operations has been poisoned by by COVID and by <clears throat> just a runaway train of, 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 of misunderstanding of roles here uh, by those who are responsible for establishing them. Uh, and a general public that is just so civics less informed than ever, just kind of, you know, watches this whole thing go by the boards. It, it, it is, it is quite something, but the hope that the federal government is going to send more stimulus here uh, to save the day is beginning to wane, actually. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats in Washington can't get it together, and, you know, with the election being what it is, uh, I don't think they're going to have any more information or cash flow right after the November election than they do now, right? I, I, I don't either. And, and, and maybe that comes and maybe we can adjust a budget we passed then. But it's amazing. Our, our entire fiscal policy of the state of Rhode Island right now is dependent on the federal government giving us a bailout. And the federal government is so dysfunctional. It, it just it breaks my heart that that is our fiscal policy. That's how we're doing business is waiting for the federal government to send us money. Um, and we won't make hard decisions because we're, we're banking on that. Uh, we were banking on it in June when we said we we're going to pass our budget in August. We were banking on it in August when we said we we're going to pass our budget in September. And now that it's September, we're apparently banking on it when we're you know, anticipating passing our budget in November. Um, I, I don't think it's responsible. We should have multiple options, option A, B, and C. We should be in there now working. That's what we were elected to do. Kids can go to school. Parents can go to work. People can go to restaurants. But the General Assembly can't show up. At our, with our $175,000 plastic dividers to protect us and keep us safe. We can't show up and do our job. Hmm. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about if you could have, would have, what would you want to do? Stay with us with Blake Lippy, the Minority Leader. Final few minutes with the State Republican Minority Leader in our House of Representatives, Blake Lippy. You know, if, if you could have, would have, I mean, if, if there was some, some semblance of normalcy of government operations, you know, what is it that you would, what is it that you would want to do right now uh, from, a, from a, a, a Republican point of view or a common sense point of view? Daily, daily or weekly oversight meetings where we question all the data. We get our hands on all the data. What is our infection rate? Why are we making the decisions we are making? What happened in our nursing homes? Why do we have one of the highest congregate care setting death rates in the country? Uh, sometimes around 80% of our COVID deaths have been in nursing home uh, assisted living congregate care facilities. Uh, how are we protecting our seniors going forward so they're not, so that doesn't happen again? Um, I'd like to understand more about what the governor's doing with her emergency regulations. We have a state law that says they can't go past 180 days. The governor now has regulations governing our business, businesses, et cetera, emergency regulations that are, are extended past that 180 days. I, I wanna conduct oversight as to why we're not having the required public input on those regulations pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act. I could go on and on. There's so much, Dan. We just need to have our, our heads wrapped around everything. Um, this has affected all aspects of our state government, and um, we need to start talking about it. Yeah, you know, what's really going to be fascinating is it's, it, it, there is a, comp, a, a confluence of, of, of events and issues that will be making November a really interesting month. 
uh, not only the national election, I mean, interesting is kind of, is, is an underwhelming understatement of the word, right? I mean, <laughs> we are going to have, there's going to be so much going on between the Trump-Biden election, uh, the down-the-line elections here in, in Rhode Island will be of interest, uh, no doubt. But, you know, what happens if Donald Trump wins, then everything remains status quo. We've got a governor here who's got to go another two years with probably nowhere else to go until that. But if Joe Biden holds on and pulls off this election, there's all sorts of speculation that the governor will, will be a high lottery pick for a Biden administration, uh, which would then insert the lieutenant governor, perhaps, does he continue in a state of emergency? What does the General Assembly do to react to all of that? I mean, does it, do you reset the whole? There's so much up in the air. I've never experienced it. I only have a minute left, but I, I have, define for me what your perspective is on, in the prism you look through, on how wide open this is in terms of what could be. Yeah, I, the, the, interesting is not the word. Epic maybe is the word. Um, it, it, I agree. It just makes me fearful that people aren't doing their jobs in light of all of everything, all the chaos. Um, because if things go even more south, you know, you need to have normal structures to protect government, to protect the people, to protect the state. And right now we don't have normal governmental structures in place. And those normal governmental structures deal with the chaos. Uh, so I'm concerned that we don't have them in place when the, if more real chaos hits. Yeah, well, we shall see. Uh, we will wait for the speaker's reaction to your, uh, your letter and um, a scheduling of a meeting of the Joint Committee on Legislative Services. Toad sweet, I'm guessing. Yeah, we'll take this necessary vote. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Dan. Thank you to Blake Flippy, the minority leader. Final word in a week and back. Stay with us. We'll keep tabs on this convention center authority thing. The speaker's got a lot on his plate, not just not just a re-election bid, but a trial next week with one of his major political allies uh, facing charges of spending political money the wrong way. Details over the course of time here and on the radio at 3 till 6 on WPRO. Good night. Thank you.